We'll call this meeting to order now. Um, good afternoon, welcome to the first meeting of the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources. Madam Secretary, please take the roll. Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblywoman Bilbray Axelrod. Here. Assemblywoman Brown May. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblyman DeLong. Present. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblyman Gurr. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Here. Assemblyman Watts. Here. Assemblyman Urich. Here. Chair Cohen. Thank you, and I am present. I um, want to, again, welcome everyone to this meeting. Also to those who are um, joining us by video conference uh, in Las Vegas. Maybe not. Almost looked like someone was coming in. Uh, or if anyone comes later in Elko or anyone listening online, Welcome. Before we get started, I want to make a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, first, everyone, please silence your electronic devices, whether it's your cell phones, laptops, that type of thing. Uh, remember, committee members will be using our laptops to view handouts and other documents as well as uh, communicate. Please don't view this as a sign of disrespect or inattention. Um, in this committee, we expect courtesy and respect in our interactions during the meeting. Uh, we may not agree with each other, but we do expect for there to be uh, respect for everyone, whether it's staff, uh, committee members, members of the public, uh, anyone who's testifying, etc. If you are presenting or testifying, please sign in at the table by the door and provide a business card to the committee secretary. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state and spell your name. Um, and the organization or agency you represent, if any, for the record. Uh, turn off the microphone each time you're done speaking. And uh, especially if there are multiple people who are speaking, uh, state your name each time you, uh, you speak. It just makes it much easier for our committee secretaries. Uh, I'd like to note that all exhibits and meeting materials must be submitted electronically to our committee manager by no later than 12 p.m. Um, the business day before the meeting and 15 hard copies should be brought to the meeting for members of the public. Similarly, uh, in the past proposed amendments to a, um, similarly as in the past, proposed amendments to a bill being heard by the committee must be submitted electronically no later than 12 p.m. on the business day prior to the meeting. Please include the bill number, a statement of intent, and your name and contact information with that amendment. Public comment will be taken at the end of uh, each meeting and each person will be limited to two minutes. Additionally, members of the public may submit written testimony to the committee up to 24 hours after a hearing. Lastly, agenda items may be taken on um, out of order and different than listed and two or more agenda items may be combined for consideration. An item may be removed from the agenda or discussion of an item on this agenda may be delayed at any time. Um, so also, um, I just want to remind folks, um, especially anyone who might be new to the legislature, um, as we go on, this is a hearing that starts at 4 p.m. And uh, especially as we get later in session or when we get to deadline days, we're going to have to be fluid and flexible because there are before us, there's obviously the morning hearings, there's the floor session, which can run late. There's the early afternoon hearings. So while I'm hoping that we will be able to start at 4 p.m. for all of our hearings, there will most likely be times that we won't be starting at 4 o'clock. We will try to give people as much notice as possible, but uh, just be aware that it's, it's coming. There will be those times when we are not starting at 4 o'clock, and we won't know when we're starting, or we know that we will be starting when the previous hearing gets out whatever that is. So um, moving on, on our agenda for today, we have introductions from committee members and staff, the adoption of committee policies, and we'll hear some presentations from the Nevada Division of Mineral Resources and the Nevada Department of Agriculture. Uh, so to begin, we'll take a few moments for committee members to introduce themselves. Members, as you introduce yourselves, please include the district you represent uh, your interest in the committee or some information about your district that we might find interesting. Let's start with our vice chair, please, and then maybe we'll go down to um, Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod and come across this way and then 
go down to Assemblywoman um, Brown May and come across that way. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Natha Anderson, and it is my honor to represent Assembly District 30, which is in uh, Sparks. I call it the heart of the Truckee Meadows because I also have a little bit of the Reno area. And so this is my second time getting a chance to serve on natural resources, so I'm really honored to be vice chair. And I get to sit next to two chairs of the committee. So uh, where do we go? Um, so I'm very excited about it, though. And then I, you wanted me to speak about one area of my district, or is that correct? Um, an area of my district that I always think of whenever it comes to natural resources is the marina, which for those of you in the Sparks area, you know that that actually started off as a pit and then we had a flood. There was a whole bunch of other problems with it too. Um, and now it's all cleaned up and it's a beautiful place to live and a beautiful place to walk around. So um, something to really positive to show how we take some things that are negative and we're able to turn it into something positive. So thank you so much for this time to be able to introduce myself and looking forward to serving. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am Shannon Bilbray Axelrod. This is my fourth term in the assembly and my Second time serving on NAVRAM. I was vice chair the, my last time, so I had to think if I was on before, but my second time. Um, I am from District 34, which is in Southern Nevada, but sort of um, on the west side. I used to say sort of northwest, but I'm, I'm kind of central now because it keeps expanding further and further. Um, but it's a lovely area and I love waking up in the morning and uh, looking at the beautiful Spring Mountain Range and, and Red Rock. Um, and it's just a, it's a wonderful place to be. I, know, I didn't really understand the assignment, so I already decided that I was gonna tell this, so I'm just gonna tell this. I did purchase uh, John Ellison's fifth wheel that he had been living in at the Comstocks for like the last time and when he bought his RV. So I am a proud owner of a awesome fifth wheel and a Dodge Ram 1996 2500 Cummings diesel. Yeah, that's right. The Prius owner, electric car and that. So um, I love exploring Nevada and I have to say being in a fifth wheel is a great way to see it. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Howard Watts. I represent District 15, uh, right in the center of the Las Vegas Valley. Uh, not many uh, natural spaces left there. Very few uh, park areas, in fact. It includes uh, the uh, Arboretum at UNLV. Otherwise, uh, it's most of the Las Vegas Strip, parts of Chinatown, uh, and the uh, Downtown Arts District. Uh, this is my third session in the legislature and my third session on natural resources. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, this is one of my favorite committees and issue areas to, uh, uh, to be part of. And uh, I also enjoy getting out and uh, seeing as much of the state as possible. I'm an avid outdoors person, occasional uh, hunter and angler. And... Uh, look forward to the discussions that we're going to have this session. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Venetia Considine. This is my second session. I represent Assembly District 18, which is southeast Las Vegas and a little bit of Henderson. I have the Water Reclamation District and the Clark County Wetlands in my district. Um, so I am doubly excited to be first time on natural resources. I want it the first time, so I'm happy to be here this time. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Assemblywoman B. Duran. This is my third session. I represent District 11, which is the heart of downtown. And the only thing I can think of that we have natural there is poker machines. <laughs> <laughs> no, downtown is uh, redeveloping. I'm not sure there's a lot is going on down there. And this is my first time on natural resources. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tracy Brown May. I proudly represent Assembly District 42 in the heart of Las Vegas. I have the other half of Assemblyman Watts Chinatown, Koreatown, Spring Valley proper. There are not a lot of green spaces, although plenty for us to roam in the 
the 12 square miles that make up Assembly District 42. I, I don't have the honor of, of owning John Ellis's fifth wheel, but I am a proud angler. My mother would be proud and, and uh, had an opportunity to uh, serve on this committee last session. I'm thrilled to be back here for my second session and love to explore our outdoor spaces all over Nevada. <clears throat> Excuse me, my name's Bert Gurr. I represent District 33. And, uh, and for those of you who don't know how big that district is, come up to my office and look on the wall. I think just off my rough numbers, over 46,000 square miles, that equates to 1.46 people per square mile. <laughs> so to start and tell you the most beautiful spots, we can start on the north end at the uh, Jarbage Wilderness and go clear down to Death Valley. That's the district. Um, first session, love the committee. I'm an avid hunter, have been since I was 10 years old. I've been on the wildlife advisory boards in Elko County for off and on for years. So this committee is really up my, where I want to be, where I can talk about that stuff. Anyway, we could go on and on. Come to the office, I'll show you some stuff. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Rich DeLong, uh, I'm a freshman. I represent District 26. Uh, which is the southwest portion of Washoe County. Over half of the district is national forest system lands, so unpopulated, and that includes the Mount Rose Wilderness and the Mount Rose Ski Area. Um, I also happen to be the first geologist in the legislature for over 30 years and the first miner in over 60 years. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Toby Urick. I have the privilege of representing Assembly District 19. Uh, it is the most beautiful part of Nevada, I like to say. Southern Henderson, which is where I live, is beautiful, but then I also have that unique rural part of Clark County where I wrap around Lake Mead. I think I represent more fish, uh, rams, uh, and rattlesnakes than I do actual people, uh, but uh, goes all the way around through the rurals, uh, up into Overton and Logandale uh, and Mesquite and throughout Moapa and Moapa Valley. Um, avid outdoorsmen, hunting, angling. Uh, so I really look forward to serving on this committee as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. So my name is Selena LaRue Hatch, and I come to Natural Resources a couple of different ways. I actually grew up on a ranch out by Pyramid Lake called the Winnemucca Ranch, if any of you know ranching. And I, so I have an ag background, and you know, I was driving tractors when I was nine years old, which uh, may not have been legal, but <laughs> happened. And I also teach geography, which is the human relationship with the earth. And it's about arable land and, and all these things that we're going to be talking about. I am also love to be outdoors. I find fishing far too boring, though. I, I tend to go on the stand-up paddleboard. I like to be moving around the water, not sitting in one place. I know I just angered half the committee. <laughs> but um, my district is District 25 in Washoe County, so northwest Reno, uh, old southwest Reno. We do have uh, a lot of desert and nature on the very edges of my district. One of my favorite places to go hiking is the Hunter Creek Trail, which is in my district. And my daughter can make it a third of the way. She's five years old. She can make it a third of the way on the trail, so we're working up to get the whole way um, by summer. And when session ends, I will be going camping for a full week and not in touch with anybody. So I'm very excited for that. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Assemblywoman Alexis Hansen, District 32, about 33,000 square miles of this beautiful state. I have the pleasure and honor of representing six counties, five of which we would call rural. I live in Sparks and uh, go railroaders, that's where I graduated from, and a uh, large chunk of Washoe, all of Pershing, all of Humboldt, all of Lander, a chunk of Eureka and a slice of Elko County. So um, my district is full of lots of diverse issues which really fit me. I'm a Gemini, so I really work well having this district and uh, ranching, mining, wildlife issues, grazing issues, uh, urban issues. Uh, I love I love my district. Not to be outdone by my colleague Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod, um, did 59 miles round trip on a snowmobile 
to the Dolly Creek and Prenti Ranch areas. And if you know where those are, you are legit. So, um, and just did those last month. It was fabulous. I was out there uh, with a certain senator and could not believe how incredibly beautiful the snow-covered mountains, the sagebrush, and so happy that we have a really good snowpack this year. And not to, uh, I, I love wildlife. I'm not an avid hunter. I support hunting, but I do have one coyote under my belt that had my pug in its mouth. And so the pug survived and the coyote didn't. So thank you for being here. Look forward to discussing issues and, and uh, keeping those things that are important to us in Nevada protected. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And I think um, you could probably hear why I'm so excited about this committee and all the members and, and the diverse background that this committee brings. Um, and and that story is just amazing because I, so again, I'm Leslie Cohen. I represent Assembly District 29, uh, which is probably the, mostly the older part of Green Valley and Henderson. So it's very suburban. And I have a coyote story too. And that's what's so important about this, this committee because just a couple, you know, about four weeks ago, I was driving to work at around, you know, 7.15 in the morning and I saw a coyote trotting down the street. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's an issue that we have to address among many in this committee. Um, but I will say my favorite part of uh, my district is a new part of the district after redistricting is the, um, the Whitney Mesa, which is a large mesa that the city of Henderson has done a wonderful job with city of Henderson Parks and Rec. Uh, making a hiking trail up the side of a mesa and you go up that mesa and you don't feel like you're in the middle of suburbia you just go on this great hike and get to see all sorts of things and um, so um, yeah again I'm, I'm really happy that you're all here oh and also um, this is my I'd say this is my fifth session and my four and a half session in this committee um, so it's uh, Natural resources was my surprise love in the legislature when I started serving on it. And again, I'm just very happy that you're all here and that we're going to be spending this time together. Um, and then moving on, I'd like to introduce our committee staff. Um, I'm going to start with Becky Perrott. She's our committee, um, committee policy analyst. This is her first session. Prior to joining LCB, she worked as a corporate securities agent with the Nevada Gaming Control Board and spent almost a decade with a foreign policy organization based in DC. She has a law degree from Yeshiva University and is excited to be staffing this committee and we're excited to have her. Um, to her left is Erin Studevent, uh, who's our legal counsel and we're especially happy that you can be here today because as you all know, our um, legal staff is, is very busy these days, so we're happy she can be here today. This is her first, uh, fifth session with the LCB and her first session with Assembly Natural Resources. Um, and she has a law degree from Georgetown University. Connie Barlow is our committee manager. Uh, she comes to the Assembly from Las Vegas and uh, she's got years of experience in meeting and events industry. And she's honored to be serving the committee in her first session, and we're honored to have you here. Nancy Davis is our committee secretary, and this is her seventh session and fourth with Natural Resources. And Cheryl Williams is our committee assistant, and she's a double native Nevadan and loves anything with horses, and this is her ninth session. And you're a member of the um, Pyramid Lake Tribe, so thank you. And then, um, so with that, we're going to move on. Um, oh, and then also I do want to take a moment to recognize our um, broadcast and production service staff, um, not by name, but I just want to make sure we recognize them. Um, they're the staff who make sure our, our hearings go out, um, that they're broadcast, that they're recorded, that the public can participate. And, and they're just so 
important to um, the session and making sure that things go um, smoothly. So um, again, thank you staff for all that you do, making sure that the committee and, and everything that happens in this building happens and, and works out. So um, moving on, I wanna move on to the adoption of committee policies. Um, this is our first order of business. Members, these have been provided to you and they're also available on Nellis for the public. These policies are fairly standard and similar to those in other committees and serve to complement the assembly standing rules and joint standing rules. Uh, so with that, I'll open up for any questions regarding the committee policies. We have any questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, I will take a motion to adopt the committee policies. So moved. Thank you. So I have a first from the vice chair. Do I have a second? I have a second from Assemblywoman Duran. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, um, all those in favor of adopting the committee policies, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Okay, that passed unanimously. Moving on. We're going to have a presentation of the committee brief, so I will be turning uh, this over to our policy analyst, Ms. Pratt, um, to present the committee policy brief. Members, again, this exhibit is uploaded onto Nellis, and for members of the public, you can also find it on Nellis as well. Please go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair. For the record, I am Becky Peratt with the Research Division of the Legislative Council Bureau. To start, I want to point out that as nonpartisan legislative staff, I cannot advocate for or against any measure that comes before you. I'm going to do a quick overview of the committee brief. Members, you should have all received this, and as Chair Cohen mentioned, it's also available on Nellis. The committee brief is a general overview on what to expect from this committee during session. Additionally, the brief includes links to resources with background information on important natural resources issues. The first page of the brief provides a list of committee staff, as well as a list of certain pre-filed bills with links to the bill text. The second page of the brief lays out important dates and deadlines for the 2023 legislative session. The committee can expect to be busiest right before these deadlines. We have also provided bill statistics from the last legislative session. In 2021, this committee heard 55 measures, of which 44 became law. I expect we will have a similar workload this session. In the brief, you can also find a list of potential topics that might come before this committee. And again, some background information on the issues that will come before you. There are links to reports and publications that might be of interest. Lastly, as committee policy analyst, I am available to assist committee members with any research questions you might have related to the issues that are brought before the committee or questions on any topic you might have. The research division provides nonpartisan assistance to the legislature on a confidential basis. Please do not hesitate to reach out to me with any questions you might have. I am very excited to be staffing this session and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions on the um, brief? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move on to presentations. Uh, so we have two today. First up, we have the presentation from the Division of Minerals. So I'll welcome Administrator Vischer and Deputy Administrator Giglieri. Uh, gentlemen, please go ahead when you're ready. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Vischer. I'm the administrator for the Nevada Division of Minerals. With me today is my deputy administrator, Rob Galeri. And I'd like to thank uh, Chair Cohen and the committee members for the opportunity to provide a brief overview of what uh, our agency does uh, and some of the tools and resources that we make available to the public and the legislature. So part of it is our, our makeup. So we actually have a commission on mineral resources it's a seven-member body appointed by the governor. Um, you can see what it, the descriptions are there. So the Division of Minerals is part of that commission. Uh, we report to the commission. Uh, we have a small staff, but what we're supposed to focus on are um, 
the impacts of mineral production in the state. So we keep track of mine production, geothermal production, oil production. But our biggest program is our abandoned mine lands uh, public safety program. And this is resolves around the uh, public safety or physical safety impacts from historic legacy mine features, uh, which we have a lot in the state. That's our biggest program. So that's kind of a public safety component. We have a public outreach component, which is part for that public safety, but also uh, educating the public with regards to what rocks and minerals are, what the mining industry represents, how things are used, um, that sort of thing. We are also the uh, oil, gas, geothermal uh, permitting agency for the state. Uh, even if it's on federal land, we're involved with the permitting of fluid minerals. And then last session, there was a new chapter added for uh, dissolved mineral resource exploration. So think of lithium brine. Um, and so that is a new chapter, and we regulate the exploration permitting of that, not the production of it, just the permitting of the exploration. So we have two offices, one in Carson City, one in Las Vegas. We have 11 FTEs. Uh, somewhat interesting about that is we have eight unclassified employees and three classified. Um, it seems to work well. Uh, all of our unclassified employees came from industry, uh, most with a geological degree, uh, three with master's degrees in geology. Um, we do get not we don't do not get any general fund monies, so it's fees on mining claim filings at the county, which I'll elaborate on, and then some grants and assistance agreements that we get from some federal agencies. We have a number of different chapters uh, that we um, are authorized uh, under. The first being um, 513, and the biggest one in that is our abandoned mine lands public safety program. So this picture here is. Um, a cupola that was built up in Virginia City, and I'll, I'll elaborate that on that a little bit. But what we do is, or mandated to do, is investigate where these features are, determine whether they are a public safety hazard, um, and rank them, and then identify whether there is a responsible party. The responsible party is not who created it, because that was up to 150 years ago. It's whose property is, is it on now, if it's private, or is there a claimant, a mining claimant, who essentially has inherited that as a liability to address? Or is it on public land with no responsible party, those we consider orphans, and we address those? Um, we have a dedicated funding source for this program, and it's $4 of the filing fee that's collected at the county of the total $10 per mining claim filing. So 40% of that comes straight to the AML program. Um, and we do have quite a bit of outreach in our Stay Out, Stay Alive program, um, which recently received a, um, an upgrade quite a bit and purchases on um, social media accounts over the holidays, um, uh, quite, quite responsive. Um, we do also get a one-time $20 per acre fee on disturbance that's permitted on public lands. And that goes to address the securings of those orphans. A little bit more about it. So an example of what was done in 2022, 872 securings. So those securings can be uh, a fence, uh, perimeter fence around it, or it could be uh, what we call a hard closure, or something where it's more permanently f uh, fixed. And that can be filled, backfilled, foam filled, uh, polyurethane foam, uh, expansive foam, or covered uh, in a way that prevents uh, accidental entry by people, but still allows for um, uh, bats and desert tortoises to, to go in and out. Um, so you can see the work that was done by us and our partners. Uh, we also partner quite a bit with the BLM as they have the lion's share of the land and the lion's share of the hazards on those lands but also the Forest Service, National Park Service, Army Corps of Engineers. And currently we have 83% of the more than 24,000 hazards identified, secured in this state. Um, we think that there's anywhere between 250 and 350,000 abandoned mine features, and about uh, 50 to 60,000 of those are uh, dangerous, deep enough um, that they represent physical safety hazards to the public. So 
we're, we're getting close to halfway there. So how do we manage this? How do we address these? So I said we could just put a fence around it with a sign. Uh, we could put a grate across it to allow the bats to come and go. Uh, we can fill it uh, if we can do that with uh, approval from the BLM, or we can fill it with foam. Uh, we use the foam um, targeted for sites that obviously can't be backfilled um, or uh, not an easy way to, to, to address it any other way, but there is no significant biological habitat. So it's a new tool that we have in our kit. This is the example of the foreman shaft. Um, this is what it looked like before. Um, this is a, an historic um, shaft, very large structure. One of the concerns here was the blocks that were used for the foundation, uh, the stonework, uh, was hand, hand carved and placed up there. So very historic. Um, the archeologists really didn't want us to impact or actually touch any of that. So how could we effectively close something that was this tall, this broad, the opening, and we knew it was uh, potential bat habitat. So bats were coming and going inside this thing, about 165 feet deep, but it had been considerably deeper as tends to happen, nature wants to fill in those holes in the ground, um, but sometimes people will use them for dumping grounds, uh, often for trash, uh, and sometimes they'll bridge off with the debris, and then more dirt and material falls on top of it, so you have a false bottom, uh, that bridge. In this case, there is a false bottom. We don't know what's underneath it, how steady it is, so we needed to make sure that we could cover this in a way that would protect the habitat, protect the cultural work of this uh, fixture, the foundation. Um, and this was a big challenge. <laughs> this is our biggest one to date. Um, it's what we've created is the largest known wildlife compatible uh, structure up there. It's in a National Historic Landmark, so we were not allowed to change anything on the ground. Uh, we did this without, with only impacting less than 120 square feet of ground. So everything you see there actually is supported by posts, and none of those posts interact with the, the, the building blocks, if you will. And even though it looks like it's drilled into it, it's not. Um, the structure is quite big, quite heavy. We had to uh, utilize a sky crane to bring in the five beams that go across it. Um, but it's, uh, it's quite the engineering feat. It also can expand and contract with the uh, temperatures. So um, you can drive to this. It's right off the truck route. If you know when to look, you can see it, but it's pretty low visibility. Uh, the BLM will be erecting a uh, informational um, sign at the site to more discuss the history of it, what it looked like before, um, some of the challenges with this. Uh, another project that we completed, um, not quite on that si same uh, expense scale, but quite significant, were the Arden closures in Clark County. Um, this is on the southwest, southwest side of uh, Clark County, or Vegas. Um, and as Las Vegas grew, it was becoming closer and closer to people and even a school at the base of these structures. These are large room and, pil room and pillar gypsum uh, features. They've been inhabited by homeless. They were being used to recreate, um, have um, uh, music events, band events, um, uh, quite a concern for the county, and it's actually on county-owned land. So we partnered with Clark County to address these and filled them all in, um, but it was quite the effort, and it required a lot of partnership uh, to get this done. Uh, we have to exclude any wildlife that may be in there. We had to exclude people that were trying to live in there, and you can see one of his structures. Um, uh, he'd been known to the, to the police for quite a while. Uh, it took a little bit of effort to get him to relocate, uh, but they were able to do that. Uh, a lot of contributing partners on this one, um, and it was, like I said, it was a, a large earthwork project, um, not quite the same as the Foreman Shaft project. About $300,000 expensed, uh, split pretty equally between Clark County and ourselves. 
Our AML field work consists of going out into the field, looking at all these features, and in 2022, we got 639 new hazards inventoried. We uh, secured 872 known hazards. We revisited a number of hazards, and that's a growing issue for us because the fences, which are temporary in nature, um, only last about five years, and that's pretty much just because of the elements. So wind, weather, and of course people uh, vandalizing them, uh, but proximity to the public wasn't really the primary driver, it's, uh, it's age. Um, so that component, um, putting up fences, is a temporary thing. Um, it's something you're gonna have to maintain, and that is part of what we have to do. Uh, we have eight interns that we hire in the summer. These are usually freshmen and sophomores um, at UNLV, UNLV and UNR. Uh, they work about 13 weeks. Uh, it's a great paid internship. And for a, a, quite a few of them, it's their first time to get into the field and see what Nevada is all about. Uh, and we cover a large part of the state during those 13 weeks. They get a lot of work done. And we've made great strides with technology. So now each of the interns has a field tablet that has the entire history of our AML database and program, pictures, um, GPS, built-in camera, it's all there. Um, you can upload, download information if you have access to the internet, which is always a challenge in rural Nevada, but uh, uh, getting a, an awful lot of work done. So that's um, the first part, that inventory, and then the permanent closure work that we're looking to do. And so there's some numbers up here you can see about the projects and what we're looking to do. We actually do have a project um, up by Logandale uh, where we're going to be doing something similar to Arden, uh, another um, gypsum room and pillar uh, uh, project, and we're going to be closing those off because there's new uh, ATV trails that are being proposed nearby. So we're looking to make sure that we address these hard closures in areas that uh, have increased public visitation, new trails, um, outside of uh, parks, that sort of thing. So um, fluid minerals, I uh, did mention that we regulate oil, gas, geothermal, and, and dissolved mineral resource exploration. Uh, real quickly, we don't see a lot of oil exploration. Um, about two permits a year, maybe one drilled a year. Um, our declining production says a lot. Um, we're, I think, 28th in the nation for oil production. Uh, but we did have a, a peak where there was quite a bit of production and a lot of interest. And because of the um, amount of federal land that's available for exploration, we see a lot of interest in leases. Um, but at the end of the day, when it comes down to actually drilling, there's very little. So there's a lot of speculation that's going on with regards to oil in Nevada. Uh, we have 99% of the oil wells in the state are on public land. Geothermal development. Uh, in, in contrast, about 60% are on private, 40% on public. Um, and obviously geothermal is of um, a lot of interest now. Um, in the last geothermal lease sale that the BLM had uh, set a new record for the number of leases, but also the amount of money, the revenue that came in. Um, and those are bid on. So the beginning bid is $2. and this last lease sale, I think the high was $52 an acre, really high. Um, and, and some other companies that have not been uh, exploring in Nevada before are now interested. Uh, and some of it involves some new technology. Um, but we have a great potential for more geothermal in the state. Uh, anxious to see how this um, moves forward. But we're seeing more and more permitting we, than we've ever seen on geothermal. And we coordinate all of the permitting efforts with the BLM. BLM, if it's on federal land, they have primacy. We communicate, make sure we're seeing the same application. We wait for them to approve it, and then we approve it. Um, we also have to uh, coordinate with other state agencies. So the Department of Wildlife, uh, Division of Water Resources, Bureau of Water Protection Control, and if it's a proposed injection well, um, underground injection control, all have to have a chance to review the application before we review, before we approve it. Um, so there's an opportunity for a lot of back and forth with the other agencies. And then uh, lithium, so dissolved mineral resource exploration. This is 
um, something that's been growing quite a bit, but over the last year immensely. So 47% increase in the number of lithium claims um, year over year. Um, and what we regulate are the lithium brine side, not the lithium in clay or hard rock, just the brine side. And the reason why is up until the last legislative session, I should say the prior legislative session, so 2017 or 19, um, you had to have a water right if you were going to pump to test to see if you had lithium in the brine. Water rights are not easy to get. Water rights and the application for those are appealable. So what was occurring was um, a hindrance of the opportunity to actually explore and see whether or not uh, there was lithium in brine below your valid mining claim. So we provide a de minimis amount for your project, not per well, of five acre feet. And that was done uh, in consultation with the legislature at the time, so that's in statute, and with water resources, uh, with the understanding that this would be sufficient for an explorer to figure out whether that was a resource, kind of quantify it, um, but without uh, using a lot of water in the process. Again, this only affects exploration, so it doesn't affect the existing uh, lithium mine at Silver Peak that Albemarle has. A lot of outreach. So um, we do this uh, in our earth science workshops that we have, um, career fairs, Nevada Day celebrations, STEM fairs, conferences. Um, we get a lot of requests to come into classrooms and provide uh, specific kinds of presentations, but rocks and minerals are generally the one. What, what are minerals used for? Where do they come from? Where do the rocks come from? Why are they here? Um, and it's always a lot of fun to go into a, in a classroom and see the light bulb light up in the kids when they see this. Um, we conduct two teachers workshops a year where teachers can get uh, professional development education credits uh, for free. Uh, we do this in concert with the Nevada Mining Association's Ed Ed Education Committee. Um, these are free to the teachers. We do one in Las Vegas during Easter break, spring break, and then one during the summer up north. We arrange for tours as part of this to uh, mining sites, but also to natural resource sites so that they can actually see uh, the geology on the ground uh, and how that, how that works. Um, so we have a workshop <clears throat> in March in Las Vegas, and then one in June in Winnemucca. We typically get uh, close to 100 teachers at each of these, um, and they leave with all sorts of swag and all sorts of rocks and minerals that they can take into their classrooms. The intent is to teach them how to teach earth science to their kids. Earth science tends to be one that teachers are not as confident in elementary school particularly in teaching. Um, and so we're trying to make it easier. And these also align with all the, um, the criteria for the activities, uh, state standards. A lot of presentations. So 239 last year. Um, we had to um, pivot a bit during the pandemic. And uh, staff actually created 17 different distance learning educational videos posted on our YouTube channel and our open data site. Um, and then also did virtual classroom presentations as the technology advanced to make that easier for the kids in the classrooms to receive this. Um, they're still on our website. They're quite popular. These are some of those. Um, so we have it on everything from the rock cycle to fun activities for younger kids to much more in, um, much more intense ones on erosional processes, geomorphology. Um, but if you have any kids or you uh, know of somebody that would uh, like to take advantage of these, these are great. And they range in, in length from 12 minutes to an hour long. So uh, quite a diverse range. What we've seen lately is a migration to providing information through open data sites. So this is Esri's open data platform sharing spatial information and with the ability to download it as shapefiles if you have an ESRI license or as Google Earth files if you want to use Google Earth 
or even the raw data as CSVs where you can open it in Excel. So what we've done is taken all of this public information and made it available on all our open data sites. So every single mining claim ever located in the western U.S. we have on a site. All the active mining claims, all the historic notices and plans, it's on our site. You can download that information. Uh, it, it's a great resource. So from an exploration standpoint, which is where I came from, uh, this is a great asset to understand who's doing work where, where are the commodities, where are the occurrences. So a lot of interest in critical minerals, where are they, uh, it's on our website. You can download that information, you can play with that information, you can make your own maps. Um, and all of this is free. So it's public data. We've got a really good way of manipulating it, harvesting it, and displaying it. So even the BLM, which is a lot of this data, they use our website because it's easier to use than their own. Uh, we're quite proud of that. Uh, mines registry. So we keep track of all the production in the state. Um, this is self-reported from the operators. Uh, we do share information back and forth with the Department of Taxation so that we're getting uh, proper reports, uh, but we do not audit the numbers, but we do keep track. Uh, we publish this information in an annual report. Um, it's important to see the, the contributions for the various commodities. Obviously, gold is the big one. Uh, copper is next, but not to be forgotten, uh, aggregate and geothermal. Right, so there's quite a bit that are being contributed there, and that's one of the things that I think uh, a lot of the public in Nevada forget about is all the aggregate operations that we require almost in our daily lives, um, whether it's roads, um, cinder blocks, um, anything. If you're converting from um, or converting to a zero scape landscape, you're going to be using dimension stone, you're going to be using sand and gravel, and all of this stuff comes out of the ground. Um, and it's probably not too far away from you because the biggest cost is not the excavation, it's the transport. Mining claims. So under the mining law, how you locate a mining claim, what you use for monumenting is set in state law. So it's in state statute. So we work with the county recorders to make sure the forms that are used meet the recorder's requirements for the size, the spacing, um, the spot for the stamp. Um, you don't have to use our forms, but we recommend that you use our forms. Um, so this is one of the things that we get asked quite a bit about is how do I, how do I stick a claim in Nevada? What, do I, what am I supposed to use? How do I know where to go? So we get lots and lots of questions about that as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, how do I know if I have the mineral rights to a property? We get that a lot. And that's not an easy answer. Um, and that's not some one that we can usually answer. We can get part of the way. Um, we may be able to answer some of that, but a lot of it is uh, just in the recorded deed. So it's back to the recorder's office and looking at all the deeds of conveyances. And there's a reason why there's an entire industry of mineral landmen, and this is all they do. Reclamation bond pool. So we actually have a little bit of an insurance company component to us. Uh, to assist with exploration companies uh, to get expeditious bonding. <clears throat> so understanding that you're not allowed to disturb uh, any of the ground until you have a reclamation bond in place. The bond amount is determined by the regulatory agency, BLM, Forest Service, uh, NDEP. It was taking, this was a few years ago, but it was taking uh, up to a month or more to adjudicate a bond for a notice level project and it was holding up uh, exploration. So we created a statewide bond established with the BLM to write up to two and a half million dollars of bonds on these notices. And we can expedite that. We can get the bond in place uh, in short order, less, less than a couple hours. And then that would make it easier for the exploration is to, to, to do their work. In exchange, we take a uh, $2 annual or 2% 2 annual premium to fund that bond pool. It's quite healthy. Uh, the bond amounts, again, are set by the regulatory agency. For notices, it's 100%. So there's no liability to the state because we receive 100% of the funds for that bond. 
Um, plan level, it's a little bit different, but it starts at 50% and goes up to nearly 90% depending on the size of the bond. We only have a handful of those because it's not really, not really our bailiwick. So insurance companies who write sureties do that much more often. And I'll conclude with a picture of that uh, foreman shaft and the contractor is Environmental Protection Services uh, based here in Carson City. Um, and really encourage you to go out and take a look at this and if you're brave enough, go stand on it. Yeah, it, it can accommodate the entire population of uh, Virginia City on it. Um, and we'd be happy to answer any questions and if I can't answer them, I'll steer you to Rob. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, committee, so far I have questions from Assembly Members Watson, Bill Bray, Axelrod. Just let me know if you have any questions. Uh, go ahead, Assembly Member Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I had a couple questions related to uh, reclamation. Um, and so I know that there's been some uh, federal investments recently in uh, in certain mine reclamation activities and uh, oil and gas, uh, abandoned oil and gas well um, uh, plugging and remediation. So I was just wondering, and I, I know a lot of uh, those programs uh, were either focused on areas that had higher concentrations of those things. Some of the mine uh, programs, I think, were specifically uh, geared towards coal mining. So I was just curious, um, was your agency eligible for any of those federal funds for either um, mine or uh, uh, orphan well uh, remediation? And, and, um, and then particularly, have there been any issues with um, uh, abandoned uh, oil uh, and gas wells in the state? I know that, again, we had a boom historically and not a lot going on now, so I was just wondering if you could provide some additional uh, information about that. Uh, Mike Vischer, for the record, through, uh, through you, Chair, to Assemblyman Watts. Um, we do not have any orphan oil wells in Nevada, so there was nothing for us to, to try to get. Um, on the abandoned mine side, so there's, there's two programs now. One is coal. Uh, the other is for hard rock. Um, we were Expecting to see some significant funding uh, that was authorized, um, but it really just stood the program up um, a year ago with $5 million, and it, that same amount was continued in the current year. Um, that doesn't go very far for all the states, um, uh, understanding that a good portion of that goes back to the agency to run the program. They're expecting considerably more, but it didn't, didn't come to pass. Um, we have been uh, in consultation with the agencies um, to make sure that they understand the nuances that are represented in our state versus other states. And Rob has done quite a bit of work on the inventory database with USGS because a big component of that program is where are the issues, what are the issues, uh, we need the data. And so it starts there. We've been working on this for, since 1987, so we have a robust database, but a lot of states don't. Um, we are hoping to see some of those uh, monies become available as grants, and we will be seeking those. Um, right now, we've got quite a bit of um, um, partnership and funding from the BLM, and the federal agencies will also be receiving some of these monies. Uh, historically, we can contract the work, get work done on the ground uh, faster than the federal agencies can. And so the current assistance agreements and grants make it easy to accomplish that. And so some of that money that comes to the feds ends up with us, but we'll be competing for some of those statewide uh, grants as well. And we look forward to that and hopefully more revenue in the future. Thank you very much. That's extremely uh, um, informative. Uh, the other question that I had somewhat related, you mentioned um, uh, mining claims. I know that uh, uh, a little while ago we had a statutory change around um, certain PVC mine claim markers that uh, have significant uh, wildlife impacts allowing those to be removed. So I was just wondering and I know that there have been some efforts, including by kind of um, different outdoors groups, volunteer groups, 
to try and identify and remove those. I was wondering uh, what, if any, involvement uh, your uh, office has had in trying to either identify or kind of track some of those efforts to uh, remediate those um, mine uh, claim marker issues. Uh, Mike Bisher, for the record, through you, Chair Cohen, to Assemblyman Watts. And I'm sorry, feel, feel free to go directly to the okay. member. Great, thank you. Um, so actually, we were involved in that legislation because um, there are some nuances that go along with those monuments that um, are only really understood by the companies that located them. Um, but yes, thankfully, uh, now they can be removed. Uh, and so our interns, when they're in the field and they find these, they'll knock them down. Um, it is uh, unfortunate to see the number of um, birds and reptiles and insects that are trapped in, in these things. Um, they're not legal monuments anymore, uh, so they can't be used. Um, and so that's a good thing. Uh, lessons learned. Um, but if we find a, a good density, uh, we'll forward that to the... Um, the wildlife agency who usually coordinates with like the Audubon Society and they'll do uh, field trip efforts but it needs to be kind of a, a, a high density environment to make it worth their while because these posts are typically um, 600 feet apart uh, and that means a lot of moving around. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the question. Um, thank you for being here today. So um, I have, I'm have, i going to make them compact. Two real quick questions, so I'll make it compact. Um, one, you talked about the, the lithium, lithium and the exploration, and I know um, several you know, people are concerned about the amount of water that that exploration, exploration takes. So can you just discuss what that bill was exactly? I know we have a lot of new people, uh, what that did. And, and um, I know you said what it did, but the amount of water so we can kind of understand where we're headed. Uh, I know people are very excited about lithium exploration in Nevada. You know, we're one of the only states that has it. And, you know, it seems like on the horizon it's going to do big things. Uh, for our economy. And then the second thing, which kind of dovetails it, um, how many Superfund sites do we still have? Is that is that in your purview? Mike Bisher, for the record, uh, Assemblyman, Assemblywoman, um, no. So Superfund is uh, under NDEP's uh, Bureau of uh, Corrective Actions. Um, so that's not part of mine. Uh, with regards to the water and lithium, um, the five acre feet was determined to be uh, sufficient to assess whether there was a resource there, maybe not to quantify it to the point you could mine, but to know whether or not there's something there to move forward on and to secure water rights. Um, and five acre feet is also the kind of the minimum threshold for a waiver for um, all sorts of other types of, of wells. So in support of exploration, drilling for hard rock, for oil, for geothermal, you can get a waiver from the state engineer to use five acre feet. Um, so it was a compromise. It was a bit of back and forth. Um, and I think it's important to note that the lithium brine exploration projects that are being explored for in Nevada today do not contemplate a similar mining method, a solar evaporation concentration method, like is being used at Silver Peak, which is obviously very water intensive. Um, and a lot of it is lost through evaporation. Um, they have that water right for mining and milling, uh, which that is their beneficial use. Um, what's being contemplated instead is some sort of uh, direct lithium extraction technology um, there's a lot out there. There's one plant being built right now uh, in Clayton Valley to test that, also in the Salton Sea in California. Um, we're waiting to see if that technology works out, but the, on the premise, uh, it would remove over 90% of the lithium and would consume about 15% of the water. So 85% would be reinjected and there'd be no change to the constituency of the water that was pumped and what was injected. 
So what that means is the consumptive water right that you would need would be significantly less than the current mining method that's uh, in the state. And I just wanted to put one thing on the record because I know there's some new people here. So, and tell me if I'm wrong on this. I think like an acre feet is like around 300,000 gallons-ish. Mike Bisher for the record. Uh, it's 325,000 acres. Okay, so. 25 gallons. So the five, I'm doing really quick math, but like a million some on gallons. So yeah, you, if you think about a, an acre foot is comparable to an Olympic size swimming pool. Okay, that's, thank you. Yep. Appreciate that. Okay, committee, do we have any other questions? Okay, um, I have some questions. You mentioned the, um, the rise in geothermal permits. Um, do you know what the basis is for why those numbers are going up? Mike Bisher, for the record, really it's the, the interest in renewable energy. The prospects for geothermal in Nevada are higher than any other state. Um, the ability to explore in Nevada uh, is easier than some other states. Um, the technology is here. The um, meaning those that are doing geothermal, like ORMAT, uh, like Cirque Energy, they have their premises here in Nevada and their plants and operations here. Um, and the renewable portfolio standards of our state and California um, create the demand for renewable energy. The ability to create significant amounts of electricity from a relatively small footprint uh, is why geothermal is really being considered. It's, it's on the acre, or on the order of 3.2 um, acres per megawatt produced. Solar is 6.1 acres per megawatt. Wind is like 49 acres per megawatt, just because of the size and the footprint of those blades with regards to you can't do anything else underneath it. So if you have a smaller footprint for the same amount of megawatts, you're gonna to look towards that. Um, and I think it's really just, it's the interest from companies that want to add geothermal to their portfolio or to offset their carbon footprint through renewable energy. And certainly there's a lot of cohabitation of solar and geothermal and battery storage, thermal storage being considered. So it's really an evaluation of all the tools in the tool chest and how do they work together. Um, but uh, I think it's also the investments, the incentives that are there for companies to um, use government monies in part to support some of their activities as they explore and build out. So it's a combination of all those factors, I think. Okay, thank you. And do those so are those companies, do they, do you have any, and it's really anecdotal, that you, you probably didn't bring this information, but do they tend to come from, from the U.S.? Are we seeing them from, from foreign companies? Do these, are these established Nevada companies? What are you seeing? Mike Vischer, for the record. Um, probably half are from established companies that have a presence in Nevada, may not be producing yet, but they already have exploration in Nevada. Um, quite a few um, out of the oil industry that have now created a branch for renewables or geothermal and are looking to apply their knowledge, uh, skill sets, and data analysis from the oil side to a different fluid mineral, geothermal applying some of those technologies in a new way. Um, we do have a, a small amount of uh, outside U.S. interest in geothermal on the, the leases. Uh, some of those seem to be more speculative in nature, um, buying up something just in hopes that you'll sell it down the road, um, as can happen in just about anything. Um, but most of it is, is from companies that have explored in geothermal um, or have a renewed interest in it in geothermal uh, and yeah it's, so it's a little bit of a blend but 50% of those uh, already here expanding their footprint. All right 
Thank you. And then, so one of the things that I always thought was kind of interesting about your agency is that you, you basically are kind of doing advertising and getting the word out about mines. And, but you're geologists and engineers and scientists, like what do you, I mean, you're, you guys have no social media training. You have no, like what, how are you? Are, are you receiving any assistance or are, are, do you have anyone on your staff that has training on on advertising, that type of thing? I mean, I remember when I was a kid, we used to see the commercials about staying out of mines and I haven't seen those in a really long time. And how, how do you know how to, that, there's an actual skill set, right, to, to doing that. How are, how are you doing that since that's not really your bailiwick? Mike Vischer, for the record, that's a great question. It really is. I think it comes back to uh, your passions, right? So um, if you're really passionate about something, you become a great spokesperson for that. So we're kind of science nerds. We're geeks, right? We, we like geology. We like rocks. We like trying to explain to people what's so special about these things. Um, and so we really enjoy educating people about it. And we've learned the hard way what works and what doesn't work. And if we need assistance, we contract that, right? So with our latest um, Stay Out, Stay Alive campaign, uh, which is Jimmy King, King of Bad Ideas, uh, just check it out on our homepage, um, we hired a firm to help us. We created the storyboard, if you will, um, but getting the, the uh, filming was done by a professional film crew, using people out of Vegas and New York, and then we had the whole digital marketing side of things, uh, which was another contractor that worked in conjunction with the creator to get that placement so that our ad for Stay Out, Stay Alive showed up as soon as somebody typed in Abandoned Minds. Um, you pay for your preference when you search on YouTube. Those videos that show up on the right-hand side, people are paying to get those to pop up so they're the top viewed. If you have great following, a huge following, they'll, they'll pop up on their own. But if you have to start from scratch, you gotta pay your way. And those are senses, cents on the clicks. But um, our, our uh, YouTube um, video was seen over 100,000 times um, and all across the world, <laughs> uh, we have requests for the license plate uh, frame that says don't be stupid stay out stay alive um, on abandoned mines and we get requests from all over the globe mostly from Nevada and California but uh, it's nice to see that message get across it comes back to the passion about what it is you do if you believe in it um, you can probably come up with a pretty good story to tell might need somebody to help polish you it off but um, a lot of it is uh, in-house expertise skill sets um, that somebody has when they came to us, whether it's uh, graphic arts, video illustration, whatever. Um, and a lot of it is just trial and error and just learning it. I got, I got a really smart staff. Okay, thank you for that and thank you for the presentation. Uh, last call for questions. Okay, seeing none. Thank you, gentlemen, we appreciate it. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to a presentation from the Department of Agriculture and grab Director Gogachia um, and your staff. Um, so for people who are new to the um, committee, the Department of Agriculture is fascinating to me because it covers so much and I think I, I always used to forget how much it covers, but it really, it, it's involved in so much um, in our state. Um, so with that, uh, Dr. Gogachia, uh, go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, JJ Goikachia, for the record, common spelling, G-O-I-C-O-E-C-H-E-A. 
If, if, if I may, Director, um, I've been vice chair for this committee, so I actually know how to spell your name. I'm, I'm so sure you do, but I, I was following directions about making sure I spelled my okay. name when I first came to speak. So I, I wanted to make sure I got it right. See, she gave me a thumbs up. So I don't know what's worse, having to go on the first day or having to go last on the first day. So um, I appreciate the opportunity today. I do have some staff members uh, here with me. I have Admin Services Officer Marco uh, Markovic. Uh, and I have Administrator Amara Vigil and Administrator Doug Ferris. So if we get into some questions I can't answer, I might have those guys come up. I've been on the job about three weeks, so hopefully we can uh, get through this. All right, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Nevada Department of Agriculture, as you said, we touch a lot on, on a lot of things. So this is just a picture uh, of our staff from... Oh, this was a couple of years ago. Uh, our staff kind of fluctuates up and down. We're not immune to the problem a lot of us are having right now. We have some vacancies, including seasonals. We're sitting around 20% right now. But we are doing a, a good job of recruiting and getting those filled. You know, our mission, uh, preserve, protect, and promote Nevada agri agriculture. And that's what we're going to get back to and really focus on. Uh, while we're not as big as mining, you know, the mineral guys are cool. They have all the, the cool dollars and all that stuff. We are a fairly sizable industry in Nevada. Uh, in 2020, that's the last set of numbers we've got fully compiled. Uh, $5.21 billion we put back into the Nevada economy. Uh, about $900 million of that was ranching and farming, and then $4.31 billion food and beverage manufacturing. So that's a lot of row crop stuff, things like that. Those are also kind of lumped into there. Here's just a breakdown by county, uh, if you will, and, and I have to tell on my executive assistant when she went through and put this together, she left Eureka County off, and that's probably not a county to leave off for me, because that was the first thing I'd picked up, but uh, <laughs> she did get it put back on there, so, so good job, Sam. Uh, you guys will see, you know, Clark, uh, over $2 billion in agricultural economic output, so we, we do have a big footprint uh, all across this state. How are we broke down uh, as far as employment sector? You'll see about 58% food and beverage, 42% in, in farming and ranching. And then of that, how many have one to five or up to 100? And you'll see by far we're smaller operations for the most part, about 70% of us smaller, some ma ma and pa operations, family operations, you might have one to five employees uh, there with you. And how is that broke out across? Beef cattle ranching is the largest employer in the farming and ranching sector by far as far as number of employers. Then, excuse me, you have hay farming, and you guys can read the slide. We go down from there. Uh, dairies are a big part, <coughs> excuse me, in this state as well. So we have five divisions uh, in the department. Uh, administrative services on here. I have uh, Director Goykachi and myself, Deputy Director Conrad. And actually, uh, Amara is the admin in administrative services. We kind of, you know, help oversee everything. We have Division of Plant Health. That is Administrator Ashley Jepson. And uh, we just welcome her back from maternity leave. She's just getting back in, and it's great to have Ashley back in. Uh, we had a couple of meetings with her this week. Uh, Animal Industry, Administrator Ferris. Uh, measurement Standards, we have an interim administrator in there right now. Uh, Bill William Strajewski. He's doing a great job. That is open. We are receiving applications for that one. Uh, we did lose a very valuable administrator there to local government right before the end of the calendar year. So again, one of those things, you go where the pay is and, and, and where you're sought after. So that's something we're dealing with like a lot of agencies. Division of Food and Nutrition, we have an interim, uh, interim administrator in there. Uh, Patricia Hope, she was the deputy administrator. And so now she has stepped up in that role and that was a retirement that then Homa retired there. And instantly I have to mess up right off the bat. All right, Board of Agriculture. So we are actually kind of governed by the Board of Agriculture as well. That was created by NRS 561, and they kind of established the policies and adopt the regulations as authorized for the Nevada Department of Agriculture to operate. It's 13 members, so last session, some of you guys will remember that that board was changed in the makeup of that board. And it is now 13. You can see on there how they are uh, broke out. Uh, the, the two biggest sectors on there are range and semi-range production and then uh, growing crops, at least one of which, excuse me, is a specialty crop. A specialty crop is you know, nuts, fruits, uh, floriculture, that kind of thing, and that is defined by the Farm Bill, 2014 Farm Bill, so what a specialty crop is in case we have some questions on that. 
here's your food supply chain. And you, you can see, you know, everywhere from, from planting all the way up until uh, we get it out to you. And Nevada Department of Agriculture touches every piece of that. Obviously, the planting, we have a seed program. Uh, we're heavily involved in, in the regulation of pesticides and taking care of our workers when those pesticides are being applicated there. Livestock and production, we have an entire division uh, dedicated to that. Transportation, weights and measures, our measurement standards, it's all fuel. And so that we test that fuel to make sure what it, what it says it is, it is. When you buy a gallon, you get a gallon. Uh, our ag police actually enforce our laws on the highway as far as you're coming through our state with livestock, we want to make sure you have the right paperwork. If you're moving around within the state, we want to make sure you're doing so legally and safely and we're not exposing the public or other livestock to diseases. Processing, obviously, we have a large dairy uh, component within our animal industry. Weights and measures, that's over measurement standards, so that, that's a picture there where they're testing livestock scales. But when you go in and you buy produce or bananas and you weigh those, we make sure that those scales are accurate as well. That is what part of Nevada agriculture does. Nevada Department of Agriculture distribution uh, speaks for itself and then trade assistance and economic workforce development. I have some slides on trade as we get later on in this uh, and we are big into economic and workforce development, ag literacy, ag in the classroom. We're starting to rebuild those programs again and trying to get those back out there. So I'll dive into a little bit of each division, uh, division of plant health and compliance. Um, so if you're, if you're getting your vegetables, you're growing your vegetables, your row crops. Again, as I said, we're, we're big on everything from the pesticide to the inspection of those. We have inspectors that go out in the field. Uh, you know, we do have a large produce uh, industry in Nevada, and so we have inspectors out on the ground making sure that, that those are done correctly. Crop production, we do certify programs for export, and again, our safety education and compliance program, that's one of the biggest things that we do. Um, we have a hemp program, and I know there's going to be questions on that, so I want to kind of get that out uh, of the way right here if I can. We do not, we do not regulate, we do not test cannabis. So we do hemp, and we have to make sure that if you're going to harvest your hemp, that you notify the Department of Ag in advance of the harvest, and we test that crop to make sure it's under the national th threshold 0.3% THC. Now, I know some, uh, there's been some news recently as far as some, some cannabis down in southern Nevada, and that wasn't a THC issue, that was a pesticide issue. We were called in, and we do work hand-in-hand -hand with the Cannabis Compliance Board in those cases. And so if it's a matter of that, it gets right back to my previous slide. To our, we're worried about that safety, and worried about that it's done correctly, and we will go in and we will conduct investigations. That is an ongoing investigation. I will not elaborate any further on that, but that is Nevada Department of Agriculture's role when it comes to the cannabis side. Plant health, uh, we have a big noxious weed program. We all know noxious weeds and invasive weeds are a problem all across Nevada. That's housed at the Department of Ag. Uh, we go out and we identify those. Um, we, we have seen just some tremendous growth in, in the areas where we're identifying the weeds and, and the uh, invasive species across the state and a lot of that's because we have some new applications ed maps where producers you can take your cell phone you can go out you see it you take a picture of it you send it in you get a latin long and what you're looking at and where you're at and we look at it and say yes this is the, the kind of plant that it is and we plot that so when we get that data back we see these big data bumps and we populate maps to that effect so we're seeing a big increase the last couple of years in that and happy to share that data with you if any of you guys are uh, interested in it, don't be alarmed. I don't think that, you know, our state is going completely to weeds. It's just we're seeing some data dumps in those individual points. Um, Assemblyman Watts may see the same thing I see, and he may have been 10 feet over, and I may have been 10 feet this way, so that counts it twice when we put that into Ed Maps. Nursery program, we have a big nursery program. Uh, our representative is from Southern Nevada on the board that represents nursery. Entomology, the state entomologist is housed uh, in the Department of Agriculture. Uh, Jeff Knight, he's, he's been there for as long as I can remember, and he does a wonderful job, and that's our grasshoppers, our Mormon cricket invasions, that kind of thing. That's what we deal with at the Department of Ag as well. And then plant pathology, do we have a die-off for some reason of some plants? We have a lab that looks at that, and then we certify weeds. We have a big native seed uh, program, and you guys will see some press coming out later this week uh, related to that as well on our social media campaign. Uh, pesticide containers, that was interesting. I spoke last night. Uh, at a Pesticide Stewardship Alliance meeting uh, in downtown Reno, and I met the guy that is the contractor for Department of Ag 
that chips all those containers that we rinse, clean, recycle. He chips those and then they turn those back into a usable product of some kind. So we're trying to keep those out of the landfill and, and being environmentally sound. We have, we have a large, large footprint uh, there as well. Division of Animal Industry, uh, we're responsible for animal disease detection and, and prevention, food safety, livestock ID, theft, commercial feed, ag product, dealer licensing, natural resource protection, uh, dairy is housed over here as well. So we have our livestock inspection program. There's a picture there, livestock inspectors at work in a, in a sale barn uh, in the western side of the state. We have predatory animal rodent control program. Uh, that, that committee meets at least annually, and they did have their annual meeting uh, to set priorities. They work hand in hand with wildlife services and with Nevada Department of Wildlife on projects to make sure we're getting the most bang for the buck uh, if we can in that regard. Ag enforcement, we do have uh, ag enforcement officers that are scattered across the state uh, that are there to protect the industry, and, and they are fully sworn, uh, and they are police officers in, in every sense of the word. Our dairy program, here you see some pictures where they're actually testing some ready to go the consumer dairy products, but we also have an on-site inspectors as well. They'll go out and they can do some bulk take samples. Uh, we do a lot of testing of goats and cows as far as diseases and monitoring for those diseases as well. And then of course our animal disease lab. And I have a little bit of experience in that having been the state vet on a couple of occasions in the past, but here we have a bat. And yes, we do have rabies in the state of Nevada, predominantly in bats, and it is not uncommon. We will see several every tends to be fall and early winter when we see those they're starting to migrate they're getting ready to go hibernate somewhere and so just a reminder if you see a bat on the ground you see one out in the daylight don't pick it up don't handle it they're there because they're sick and so um, you know use use gloves pro, uh, pick it up call uh, animal control if you need to and we do test those and, and we are the lab the only lab in Nevada that tests for that division of measurement standards uh, again assures the motor the quality of our motor fuel and lubricants and consistency of the transactions. So when you buy a gallon, you get a gallon. And when you're paying five bucks for it, you buy a gallon, you better want a gallon or 1.2. Maybe you don't want 0.8. So, and, and that's, that's, uh, that's something else we do. And then the weights and measurement, again, we have trucks that run around. We do have a vacancy in this up in Elko right now. And we're going to want to try to get that inspector filled pretty quickly because they're going to start getting out and hitting these ranches and farms in June, July, and making sure those scales are ready to go so that our producers can get those cattle shipped and those lambs shipped uh, in the fall if they do sell by the pound versus the head. Food and Nutrition Division. This is our biggest dollar-wise nutrition. Uh, we administer federal funds to provide access healthy food for Nevada's children. Uh, again, you guys can, can read that. What, what do we do there? It's Child Nutrition Commodity Support the farm to school program, state processing program, fresh fruit and vegetable program, specialty milk, national school breakfast and lunch programs. Uh, and again, these, these are all through uh, the USDA and that's how we administer those. And we have had some questions in the past, you know, my, my kids don't like their school lunch and you, you guys got to do a better job of, uh, of some of the chi well, chicken nuggets. We won't get into if it's chicken or not, but chicken nuggets and they don't, they don't taste right and they, the texture's bad. We do offer whole muscle cuts as well. But it's a budget thing guys we pass this on to the school districts so we offer these these choices out there they have so much money that they can spend on these programs obviously if they choose to go with, with the chicken breast then they're probably going to have to cut back on the peas and the carrots or something else down they only have so much money so again we don't sit that menu we get it we provide it and and we distribute that and that is out for your your school districts to make those choices we have a lot of senior nutri nutrition programs one of them that's really exciting to me is that senior farmers market nutrition program. So I think it was 4,000 uh, uh, booklets we sent out last year, and they're booklets of coupons in there. You can go to your local farmers market as a senior, and you can get fresh fruit and fresh produce from that f uh, farmer's market. So we're helping our local farmers who are growing this stuff, and we help our seniors get access to that. So we provide that, and then they send those vouchers back in, and we're able to figure out how much of that is going in. Emergency food assistance program, that's a big one. It was right around 2 million people used that uh, last year. So that, that is a very significant program. Child and adult care program, food distribution uh, for on, on our Indian reservations as well. Division of Administrative Services, we have by far the, 
least sexy of all of the divisions. We're just kind of there. To, we're the glue that holds everybody together and tries to keep it moving. Uh, unfortunately, you guys get to see us more than anything because we have to do the numbers and we have to come here and talk about the budgets and talk about what we do. We do have a fiscal services team, global trade and economic development uh, team, communications team, IC service, IT services. So when we talk about our global trade, we do have a, a, a young man that does a very good job on that, and we belong to multiple organizations, including the Western United States Trade uh, Agricultural Trade Association. And so the budget for that is very small what we get, but we leverage our USDA and federal funds. And so we do outbound and inbound export and, and, and import uh, tours, if you will, uh, quite regularly. We're seeing a lot of food and beverage uh, moving out of Nevada, as well as coffee, tea, uh, mate, livestock products, hay, and produce. And our, our largest markets, uh, South Korea is a big one, Mexico, Canada, for Nevada products. So looking ahead, uh, what's our focus as, as we get in uh, to this next biennium? Back to customer service internally and externally, and then some of that employee support. We're, we know we're not different than a lot of agencies, um, but we've got to do a better job of, of supporting our employees. Onboarding process tends to be a little wonky, uh, at times, I can just tell you coming on as a director, it was a struggle to get the paperwork right and to get things right. And if it was that hard for me as a director, I can imagine uh, an employee transitioning over uh, can feel that frustration. So we're really focused on that. And we want to enhance those economic opportunities for all our ag sectors. As I said, we rely really heavily, heavily on our food and beverage right now. We're going to continue to push on that. But we want to get back out and get some of these livestock guys and our production guys, some of our honeybee guys, some of our cottage industries. We want to really try to stand them up. And we're going to do that by building relationships with our local governments, and our non-government organizations, everything from Farm Bureau to Cattlemen to uh, our conservation districts, et cetera. So with that, I am going to pause, and I like to answer questions more than I like to read off of slides. Here's our contact information up here. Samantha Bellwood is my executive, and she does know that Eureka County matters uh, now. So uh, if you get a hold of Sam, I guarantee you I'm going to know within 30 seconds, and I'll bet you she's red in the face right now, and she's blowing up my phone. So with that, Madam Chair, uh, it's, I tried to get done before 5.30. It's 5.30, and I'll stand for questions. Thank you, Director. So I have questions from Assembly Members Bill Bray Axelrod, Considine, Brown May, and LaRue Hatch. So let's start, and then DeLong. So let's start with Assembly Member Bill Bray Axelrod. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here in your new role. I know we worked together in the past in your previous role, so it's wonderful to see you again. Um, I, I had one question, and it was just to make sure, I, and I'm going back to my, my days where I was here about, and I wrote this down, I think was it, it's chronic wasting disease. I just wanted to see if there, I know at, at a few years ago we were still didn't have any, and I just want to make sure that's still the case, and then, but then, but then you started talking about the farmer's market vouchers, and I was like, now, now I need to know about that. So if you could just tell me really quickly if we still don't have chronic wasting disease, which I'm hoping we don't, and then tell me about the vouchers, really. <laughs> sure. And Madam Chair, may I go direct? Of course. Okay, thank you. So Assemblywoman, yes, uh, chronic wasting disease. A few sessions ago, we did pass that bill, and you are correct. We did not have chronic wasting at that time, and I'm happy to report we still have not detected chronic wasting disease in the state of Nevada. And that is our goal and the goal of uh, Department of Wildlife to keep it that way, uh, definitely as long as we can. So the, the vouchers on the farmer's market, so those, are again, are for our seniors. And, and so we, we are uh, producing those booklets, and I was uh, meeting with Administrator Patricia. Uh, we, we did some emails back and forth, and we talked just last week. And so I, I believe it's 4,000 of those booklets that we put out, and you can request those. And again, there's, there's coupons in there, and you take those out. And I believe there's $75 coupons in there, and you can take those to your local farmer's market, and you can get that. So, and, and don't quote me on the $75. I might be incorrect on that. I've got a lot of numbers the last 17 days floating around in my head. But you can go and you can cash those in at your farmer's market uh, for those fruits and vegetables. And so how do our seniors get those Co vouchers? Contact us at the Nevada Department of Agriculture, and we will put you in the right place. You're very welcome. Uh, Assemblymember Constantine. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director. This was incredibly informative. 
Uh, I know that uh, just a few minutes ago, you mentioned that some of the products created in Nevada go to South Korea, Mexico, Canada, and you listed coffee, all these others. What I was curious about specifically with um, hay, beef cattle, and dairy, which seem to be the top three, what are the biggest markets for those? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Director Goykachia, for, for the record, so, and you had, um, we had dairy, milk, beef, and, and hay. So most of those are domestic markets right now. Uh, for the most part, we do see an export market uh, for our hay. Uh, that, that traditionally has gone to the West Coast and it is put into presses and then it is sent on cargo ships, uh, China, Japan, South Korea. They, did, they were taking a lot of that historically. We've seen a little bit of a downturn in, in that recently. I think part of that is a simple fact of economics. Uh, right now, uh, you can sell the hay at home uh, for quite a premium because there is no hay because of the drought in recent years. So we're seeing more of that stay domestically. Um, we do in Nevada produce some high quality horse hay as well, uh, orchard graft, grass and, and timothy and so that tends to go east some of it goes to california obviously to those horse farms but a lot of it is going east in containers uh, beef and milk uh, the beef tends to the beef that leaves nevada because we don't have a large processing uh, center here if you will we don't have any way to distribute it those tend to go to california grass or feedlots back east and then those are finished domestically some of those uh, cuts are eventually sent overseas by all means but again most of that is domestic and then most of our milk is domestic we do have uh, the dry milk plant in fallon that does export some uh, dry milk product and some of that was in fact going overseas to asia you bet Thank you for that, uh, Assembly Member Brown May. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director, for that great presentation. It's great to see you here. Um, I now have an extra question, if, if you'll indulge me, Madam Chair. Um, first, will you clarify what is domestic mean? Um, it's my understanding domestic can also mean Canada and the United States. Is that true in how you're referring to domestic use? Uh, Thank you, uh, Assemblywoman. In, in my case, domestic, I am talking about continental United States uh, domestic feeding. Most of ours are in the continental uh, United States. Now, there are free trade agreements that the United States government does have in place. We do not send very many feeder cattle other directions. Uh, those tend to be finished products that we send the other direction. So domestic feeding is staying within the United States. Thank you for that clarification. Um, now, my actual question, if you don't mind. Um, we had the opportunity during the interim to tour a number of the farms in northern Nevada. And with regard to the drought and, and obviously low water resources, um, I've seen one young farmer in particular do a transformation um, of his crop to a low water usage crop. So I'm curious to know, is there any effort a concerted effort out of the Department of Ag to help farmers transition into lower usage crops to, as a way to conserve water resources? Assemblywoman, uh, thank you uh, for that question. Yes, we do have a drought initiative at the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we did have some grant funding uh, a few years ago to try and put some conservation practices in place. I'm sure many of you are aware uh, that there is a pot of money that went to the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources uh, for uh, such an uh, such a program, if you will, uh, at, at this time. We are a part of that technical team and we are working with conservation and natural resource to try and figure out where that money is gonna go and how it's gonna do, but conservation is definitely first on our mind at Department of Agriculture and you know, getting away from some of those processes uh, that are more wasteful and you lose a lot to evaporation and, and, and trying to get them to transition over to a more water economically friendly. Uh, irrigation source so will we don't have the funding in place right now to do anything like that we are participating with Department of Conservation and Natural Resources and we're hoping to get some of those dollars over to our producers on the ground you're welcome assembly member LaRue Hatch thank you chair and thank you so much for being here oh. There we go. Um, with my background, obviously ag is something I am very interested in. And so first though, my teacher hat, my students, number one concern was their lunches. So I'm glad that you brought that up. I just had a question. You mentioned the districts choose from a menu of options, what they will offer within the district. Who sets that menu of options that you are providing to the school districts? 
Sure. So that guidance again comes from the USDA, from the federal government, uh, in, you know, as far as what we have to be able to provide to them and, and, and that suite of options, if you will. And then we fill those orders through and we have warehouses both in the north and the south. And so it, those are federal regulations and guidelines that we must abide by. And then I have a second question if that's Okay, my second question I think dovetails with Assemblymember Brown May um, about regenerative agriculture and um, whether or not you have any regenerative agricultural uh, programs within the department and in how much you are coordinating with the Conservation Commission and the Conservation Districts on the, the soil health and the regenerative ag piece. Excellent question, excellent question on that. And, and, and I think that's one area that we definitely need to improve on. And that previous slide, that is why I made it a point to talk about conservation districts in there. I, I think we've allowed that to slip uh, as an agency uh, over the last few years, and that's something we have to get back to, absolutely. And it goes right back to are we doing water conservation issues and trying to conserve that water, but it has to be that soil health. We have some very talented individuals over in the plant industry side that understand that. Now we've got to give them the tools and build that partnership so that they can go out and do that. Uh, we aren't doing the job we need to, but we will do that. Assemblymember DeLong. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to follow on um, a question from my colleague from Washoe County um, regarding uh, soil health. Um, could you, I don't, you don't need to do it at this meeting, but you could, could you provide um, the committee some more information on the scope of activities with the conservation districts? So, uh, Assemblyman DeLong, absolutely. You know, conservation districts, again, are housed in another agency, but I'm happy to work with them, and we will provide uh, background to this committee on, on exactly what we're doing with those conservation districts and, and where we have a unified vision and where to go in the future. We will provide that for you. Go ahead. And, um, what agency are the conservation districts under? Uh, Department of Conservation and Natural Resource. Okay, thank you. Assemblymember Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the excellent presentation, uh, uh, Director Goikchia. A uh, couple things that I wanted to ask about, um, yeah, just checking on a couple other programs. Um, one is the craft beverage passport, which I know uh, your department. Uh, I have one. I have one in my car. Um, I knew it. And so I, I was just wondering if you had any updates to share on uh, that program. I think it was pretty successful. So anything you could share on uh, what the the thoughts are for that moving forward? Absolutely. I was counting on a question from someone on that. I am happy to announce that the last thing I did before I left the office to come down here was sign the PO for the stamps for that passport. So they will be coming out and. And when you want them, we'll bring them to the building. You just flag us down because they are out and we're ready. And that we did approve that actual passport a couple of weeks ago. And now we got the stamps approved today. So they'll be coming out next week. Wonderful. Thank you. Follow up, Madam Chair. Thanks. Um, uh, another thing that uh, I know has been in the works and uh, was mentioned is uh, some of the state-based uh, meat processing and inspection um, programs. Uh, could you just share a little bit of an update on where things kind of stand with that? Uh, absolutely. So, uh, Assemblyman, thank you for that question. So, in-state meat and poultry inspection, uh, those regulations, uh, those draft regulations are written, and I am reviewing them uh, currently. Now, there's a couple of steps that have to take place. Uh, I'm happy to, to say that we did get an exemption uh, from Governor Lombardo to move forward on those because those were critical for us moving forward. So we do have an exemption to move forward, but the first step in that is to go to the USDA and have them review those, because what we do must be as stringent as USDA guidelines. So as soon as I'm done uh, re reviewing those and Administrator Ferris, um, I'm sure he's burning a hole in the back of my head because they've been on my desk for about five days now and I haven't got them done, but they're lengthy. And so I want to make sure that they're right. But we will, we will be sending those off to the USDA. In fact, we do have a follow-up meeting. I believe it's next week uh, with our uh, program manager that we did hire to put that together. And we are moving forward. And it is my goal to have something on the street by summertime. And you should start seeing in-state meat inspection later this calendar year. Go ahead. Thank you for the indulgence, Madam Chair. One last thing. Uh, uh, is to go back to hemp, which I know uh, is another a major topic of conversation. 
I was just wondering, I know that there are um, some processes in statute and in, pr in practice, both for potential remediation, um, and then I know that if, you know, if that's not possible, the crop has to be destroyed. Um, I was wondering, particularly when it comes to the destruction of a crop, uh, are there different options to do that? And uh, uh, particularly, could, um, could that crop be turned into biofuel or something other than being burned as a way to, to destroy the crop? That's a great question, and thank you for that. We actually had a lengthy conversation on that uh, today with some individuals and, and University of Nevada. Uh, Reno actually had some concerns on that because they're trying to get some research as well. We are kind of hamstrung uh, by the regulations and by the statute right now on what we can do. And, you know, my message is get to us early, uh, not at the last minute when you think you're ready to harvest that because, again, we might be able to do something different there to bring those THC levels down to appropriate and allow you to do something. But when they are over, um, again, we have to go by the federal guidance uh, on that, and they have to be destroyed. Um, they can't be turned into animal feed. We can't feed it to animals. Um, and, and the way it stands right now, we don't have an avenue to take them into biofuels either. So we do need some flexibility in the statute and in regulations uh, as we move forward. But I think we're going to have to see that driven on a national level as well so we have some uniformity uh, across state lines if we could. Thank you. Um, committee, do we have any other questions? Okay, with that, uh, thank you, Director. We look forward to uh, spending lots of time with you in the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm not sure how to uh, answer that, so I'm just going to let that go. Okay. So with that, we are going to move on to uh, public comment. As a reminder, public comment may be submitted in writing to the committee up to 24 hours after this meeting. Public comment will be limited to two minutes per speaker. Uh, staff will time, well, probably it's time. Oh, okay, we'll time public comment uh, to ensure everyone has fair opportunity to speak. We also ask that you do not repeat what a previous comment, uh, commenter has stated. Anyone wishing to make public comment, please remember to clearly state and spell your name and limit your comments to two minutes. Um, we're going to start with public comment from those in physical locations and then move to public comment from anyone who has called in. As a reminder, the public comment phone number is 669-900-6833. The meeting ID number is 864-367-98554. And if you need any um, accommodation, reasonable accommodation will be made. Uh, you just need to call 775-684-8550. Um, so is there anyone in Carson City who would like to make public comment at this time? Okay, seeing none. We don't see anyone in Elko. Uh, anyone in Las Vegas who would like to make public comment? Okay. Um, Seeing none, any comments from anyone in the committee? Okay. Oh, and the phone lines. Uh, PPS, anyone on the phones? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers. Okay, so thank you, BPS. That will conclude our meeting for today. Our next meeting will be Wednesday, February 15th at 4 p.m. As a reminder, uh, for the committee, we will have a tour on Monday the 13th. If you'd like to attend, I believe the tour will probably be about an hour. And if you're um, in Reno and want to just, you know, we'll have a shuttle from the building. But if you want to take your own car and just leave from Reno, you're certainly welcome to do so. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.